One of the scriptures that I love is found in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. It says, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. As each one of us have gifts and ability, the way that God has equipped us and made us who we are, we ought to find a place to serve and to get involved with. I was talking to Vernon today. He was in my office, and, and we were talking about what we were going to discuss today on service. And he said this. He goes, he goes, if you pray for something, you'll be invested in that thing. If you're involved in something, you're invested in something. So when we pray for our church and we pray for ministries, that gets us invested in what we are praying for. That's why we, we serve what we love. And we're going to ask you over the next six weeks, we do not serve this church. We serve our Lord. When we serve our Lord, whatever it is and whatever your gift is and wherever you can serve, you don't have to do everything, but you can do something. And when we all get involved in doing something, God can do great things within our life. In the, in the book Rick Warren wrote, in the Purpose Driven Church, he makes a statement of a shape. He used, everyone is shaped differently. Not everybody is gifted the same. And he uses the acrostic of shape, and he says, the S stands for spiritual gifts. When you are spiritual gifted, when you, when you gave your life to Jesus, he gave you a spiritual gift, and our job is to serve others out of that spiritual gift. But then the H is the heart of passion. When you have a heart for something, when you love kids, when you love worship, when you have a heart for something, you can serve out of the spiritual giftedness and out of your heart of passion. And then the A is talking about abilities. So you're just good at things. Uh, you may be better than this and better at that, but you are just good at things. And, and you have the ability and you can serve out of your abilities. And then your personality. Every, we all have different personalities. Some are very quiet. Some are very outgoing. Some of, us, some of us can do certain things that our personality that others can't. And sometimes we just serve God through our personalities. And this is the biggest one of them all. Experience. God never wastes your experience. Whatever you've gone through. Whatever you've done. Whatever you've been forgiven for. Whatever God wants to do within your life. He uses your experience to serve others. God does not waste your pain. He uses our pain, our experience, to serve and to help others. Let me introduce Al Schusler. He comes up and talks about one of our first ministries. Pastor Al. Thank you, Pastor Bruce. Well, everybody has a spiritual gift, and if you happen to have a spiritual gift, the gift of gab, we need you on the doors, okay? Door greeters. We have 40 door greeters right now. Every Sunday morning, somebody's at the door. We have three different doors. And uh, Sherry Clausen, where are you at, Sherry, if you would stand? Uh, she heads us up, and she keeps us scheduled and keeps it going, and we really appreciate her. And all of you that are on the door greeters uh, schedule, why don't you stand, would you? I want to say thank you for what you do. Hey, everybody. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Appreciate it very much. And incidentally, we have a new remind number for you, so we can start communicating to you through that. And if you would sign up for that at the tables in the back a little bit later, we'd appreciate it very much. We believe that the door greeters are very important. Hospitality. And really, they are the first um, living impression that people have when they come to Glenville. They may look at our grounds, they may look at our parking lot, our building, but the first human impression of the door greeters, and we think it's very important. You are ambassadors for Christ on behalf of Glenville Church, and we don't have any second-class door greeters. We are first-class here at Glenville, I guarantee you. You know, when my wife and I invite somebody to our house, I tell you what, she cleans that house top to bottom, we get the china out, get the crystal out. She fixes the best steak that you could ever. I mean, we, I'm talking French now. Okay, we get all this done. And then when they ring the doorbell, they come in. We welcome them. 
they're our guest, and we give them the very best. And, uh, and we even talk to them while they're there, okay? <laughs> and we believe that's the way a church ought to be. They get our very best. And so if you're interested in being a door greeter, after the service, right through the double doors, there's three tables. There's one that says door greeters. Come out, and Sherry will be out there, and she would like to sign you up to be a part of the door greeters here at Glenville. And if you are a door greeter, please come by. I have a remind number I'd like to give you so that we can communicate with you. Thank you, Pastor Bruce. All right. Thank you. Our, children, our, our preschool ministry is so important, and Justin Cassie Haynes heads up our preschool ministry. Now, let me tell you about a servant. Can I, can I go off script here for a second? No, you can't. <laughs> this couple, this couple is servants. They love Jesus. There's, there's not a ministry in this church that if I said, hey, I need help here, this young man and this young lady shows up to do whatever I ask them to do. So they are the epitome of servanthood. We're married. <laughs> We're not Haynes anymore. Oh yeah, we had a Hanes shirts wedding. If you guys get that, it's pretty funny. Thank you. Hanes shirts, okay. Anyway, so uh, I just would like to say that, um, yeah, it's, it's a privilege. We, we feel like uh, working with the preschoolers has been a privilege. Um, preschool is a very influential age. So you guys may have preschoolers or grandchildren or nieces or nephews. Um, for us, it was kind of where our kids were. And so to get to level on the kids for a couple hours on Sunday mornings. Um, we do have a 9.30 class that runs a little bit smaller, but we are welcome to that being as much as, as it can be. But when it comes to the children, it's our heart. We know that there's 168 hours in a week, right? And there's only three hours that they're in our preschool. But those three hours, we try to love them to Christ we have some wonderful volunteers. If you volunteer in the preschool, I'd like you to stand up. If you could, please. I'm the only one. <laughs> <laughs> They're all. Oh, oh, stand up, stand up. There we go. All right, thank you. Thank you. No, no we, have a, we have wonderful volunteers. And what I would say is uh, you have a team of about three people every week. And uh, what we worked on is we have a curriculum. And we have coloring pages and we have videos that coincide. We do songs and music and crafts. And so we really try to bring it home to where they can, they can apply what they're learning and do it together. So. so like you said, when our kids kind of entered the preschool, we started volunteering back there. So we've been back there for about four years, I think. Um, and of course, many of you, it's like, I know you if you have a preschooler or a grandchild or something, we see you back in the kids' wing. But um, this past year, we've been very, very blessed that we have, and I thank you guys so much, we've had more volunteers step up. So each week, we have a different group of volunteers um, serving. But it doesn't mean we don't need any more, because we do. <laughs> like Justin mentioned, at 9.30, we need alternates, because there's always, you know, those, many of us who are back there, have kids ourselves so if we have sick kids or just life happens and we need to switch weeks we appreciate that flexibility um, and we will give you materials if you're interested of course see us after service but some things that stuck out to me I will be very very honest when I first started a couple years back I got pretty tired we were really low on volunteers um, people just not helping in that age some people are kind of I don't know why but scared to help out preschoolers and it's a lot of work they're very very busy and they can be very tiring and I I did for a while I kind of got into a rut of I almost felt like I had to be back there instead of that I get to be back there and I'm very very thankful that God has changed my heart and I'm so excited um, I wrote down on my on my hand a percentage that has been thrown out there as Justin and I were kind of reviewing and putting it together some notebooks and going over some things we we put together some material that had some inspirational quotes and everything. Even D.L. Moody himself said, if he, could, if he could go back, if he could relive his life, whoops, if he could relive his life, he said, I would devote my entire ministry to reaching children for God. And so many times, I think that maybe we think um, it's not as important, but 90, they, studies show that 94% of adult Christians today gave their hearts to Christ as a child. 
Before the age of 14. Before the age of 14. Yes, as a child, 94%. And I'm one of those. I was 13. I didn't grow up in church, but I came here. It was here at Glenville in youth ministry that I, at age 13, I decided to give my heart to Christ and my life. And I'm so thankful that I did. But even as these children are young, um, some other quotes from D.L. Moody, that um, something that stuck out to me, he said, where one man reads the Bible, a hundred read you and me. As adults, as we read our Bible, we have a hundred other people daily reading you and me. And I think about with our children and with our kids, so much of who they become, it is caught, not taught. Mm -hmm. They catch it by the way we live our lives before them. And so if we can be a part of that ministry or if you guys have a desire to be those examples and to to lead it and to start in our children, uh, from preschool, of course, I mean, nursery on up, preschool, kids ministry. It is so vital for our future. It's so important. And of course, as we have kids that age right now, we have four small children. It has become alive and more relevant to us, but it's a whole different perspective when you are living it every day. And I'm realizing that these little eyes, and not only their little eyes, but we have neighbor kids that come into our house. And at church, we have so much love and it's a, it's a whole family of children we get to love on so if this is a ministry you think that you would like to be a part of please see us after church or see us anytime uh, we would gladly have you but just keep that in mind as you read your bible that a hundred other people are reading you and maybe you will be the one to shine Christ's light to them in their dark situation in this dark world but you might be the change in their life and i just want to reiterate uh the age group we're looking at is three to five, and uh, we do uh, any children's ministry. We do background checks, but if you want to come see us after service, we'd be happy to talk with you. And or if you would just like to pray for our ministry or help in any way, just please let us know. Thank you, guys. Cassie, when she was 13, 14 years old. We took her to camp. And she was a softball pitcher. And I was a baseball player, I thought, at the time. Until she struck me out at camp. <laughs> First woman to ever strike me out. I was like, walked around, like, embarrassed that, you know, she was, she was the woman. Okay, our next is Rachel. Uh, Clement, she's going to be talking about a new ministry here at the church. Thank you. All right, we really have a lot of exciting things going on. Um, Over the last couple of weeks, we've been planning and talking about what's coming up the next six weeks, all the ministries that we have going that are incredible. And then we started talking about where are we lacking? Where are some areas that maybe we need help getting some new ministries started? So today I'm going to talk to you about one of those. And um, we kind of titled it, Love Where You Live where you love, love where you live, okay? Because here's the deal is this is the house of God and we have certain areas that we need extra help in. And so one of the things was we thought we have restrooms that we maybe need a little help with during services. So sometimes if people come in and they've splashed water on the counters or maybe there's um, some paper towels that didn't quite make it in and maybe you're a person who says, listen, I don't want to go teach. I don't want to be greeting and because I'm not always happy maybe. I don't know. Or you just say, listen, I, I like to be behind the scenes. This is going to be a great opportunity for you because what we're asking is for a few couples to come and say before the 1030 service, maybe even during or after, we're going to just go and check the bathrooms. There's four main bathrooms, and we're just going to make sure there's not trash on the ground. There's not, um, you know, it's not all torn up. And so it's a very quick ministry. It's a very um, short commitment time each week, but it's also very important because as we have guests coming in, as you are all here, we want to present our home, God's home, as a nice comfortable place, inviting from the way when you come in the doors all the way into the restroom. So if you're a person who says, hey, I can do that. I can totally walk these couple of bathrooms. And we do need to have um, couples or a a, a man and a woman team because obviously you need to be going into the appropriate restroom. So if you say, I can, t- I can do that easily each week or every other week, depending on who volunteers. Just come see us afterwards. I'll be at a table in the back, and I would love to get you set up into helping us in that area. Thank you. I serve. I serve ministry. 
It's uh, in the next six weeks, we're just going to be discussing different ministries just like that so you know what we need and how you can serve. You know, in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, the Bible says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Our goal is to serve like Christ. The epitome of this church is the goal of this church is to be Christ-like in different areas within our life. You know, when you struggle to find your identity, nothing seems like it really works. There was a man that we all know that wrote a few songs. He wrote, maybe you know who he is if I tell you this, Blue Suede Shoes, Jailhouse Rock, Nothing But a Hound Dog. You know that man. And that man struggled with his identity. He struggled with his identity his entire life. There was not a person in the United States and maybe even the world that did not know who Elvis Presley was. But Elvis suffered from great depression. His influence within the life in music was profound. But his inner soul was disturbed. He died at the age of 42 by overdose and obesity. His personal life was a mess. A Reader's Digest article says that in spite of his enormous success, Elvis was unfulfilled and a miserable man. The story spanned Elvis's life as he searched for significance, but his death from obesity and drugs at the age of 42, his wife Priscilla said this, Elvis never came to terms with who he was, who, who he's meant to be, and what his purpose in life was. He thought he was here for a reason, maybe to preach, maybe to serve, maybe to be a care for people. That agonizing desire was always within him, and he knew he was not fulfilling it. So he would go on stage so he would not have to think about his purpose in life. And that's a man that everybody knows. You know, the way we act on the outside is not necessarily who we are on the inside. Sometimes the inside is dealing with what is my purpose and what should I do and how should I get things done. And the inside is in turmoil. But we want everybody on the outside to think everything is wonderful and great. In Proverbs chapter 3 verse 6 says, In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. He's going to do it. He's going to direct your paths and give you a straight path. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 7, But as the manifest spirit is given to each one of us the gift of God. God has given to us a purpose, a gift, a reason to serve, a reason to have an identity within your home, within the church, and more importantly, within your life. See, I believe the, one of the core beliefs within our life is that I matter. I matter to somebody or I matter to something. The church, our own personal life, we have to have a matter. Rick Warren in his book, It's Not About You, says another word for serving others is ministry. Most people think ministry means that it is the pastor's job. The Bible teaches that ministry is not something that we do by pastors. It is every Christian is a minister. Every Christian should be and is a minister. God gives us an example. He gives us his life as an example. So I want to take these three points and we're going to try to serve the way Christ served. And the first thing, he was grateful. He was grateful. Serving like Jesus means being grateful. Jesus had the attitude of being thankful in everything he did. To be him, he wanted to embrace the mindset is I want to be around others. And he said this in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. He, I, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. I like what he says here. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present. It's an action that we must do. I have to present my life for you. As Cassie said, a hundred little eyes watching us. It is our presentation. It is how we serve. It is what we do. The truth that every person has to present their bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God 
What that means is we are not here for ourselves. We are here to serve others and be grateful about what we do because it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to change somebody's life. It's an opportunity to serve somebody. It may not be a pat on the back, but it's an opportunity that in a small, small way that we get to help and we get to serve. And we need to be grateful about that. Mike, I'm going to embarrass you. Um, I had a, we had a wedding here yesterday, and we had a car broke down in the front of the parking lot. And, and, um, and the owner's wife called me and said, hey, he's having a hard time getting the starter on the car. Do you know anybody in the church that could help him out to get a starter on? I said, yep. I said, one text. And he said, on my way. Wow. You know, it may not be serving in the church, but he served in a way to help somebody out. Service. Serving in your gifts. Serving in your abilities. Being thankful that I have a gift and the ability to serve and God is using me in that ability. And then serving Jesus means being available. It means being available. Sometimes we get so busy, we can't serve. Sometimes we get so busy doing the things of our life or even the spiritual things, even the church things. We get so caught up in being busy, we don't have time to listen to God. And I want to read Matthew chapter 20, verses 30 and 32 and see, see what happens. Whenever Jesus ministered to somebody, he had to stop and do what needed to be done. He was a busy man, but in his busyness, he still saw the needs of others. And behold, two blind men sitting by the road, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, cried out saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. Then the multitudes warned them that they should be quiet. But they cried out even more saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. So Jesus stood still and called out to them and said, What do you want me to do for you? In his busy life, he heard the need of others and he stood still. Jesus stopped what he was doing because he knew there was a need that they needed to be fulfilled. Being a servant means giving up the rights to control your schedule and allowing God to interrupt at any time that he needs to. If you have the prompting of the Spirit of God and the Spirit says, time out. I need you to do something. You don't have a say, I don't want to. Because God, in certain areas, has chosen you to be a vessel to serve somebody else because you have the means and you have the ability and you have the shape. If God says, I want you, I need you to impact somebody's life, if we are ministering the way God wants us to minister and we get that prompted of the Holy Spirit, we have to stop in our tracks and we have to say, okay, Lord, now, it doesn't mean that we can help every person that comes through our doors. But it does mean when the prompting of the Holy Spirit says, I need you to serve, it is our job to serve. See, our Lord was always interruptible. When, when somebody needed him, they cried out even louder. They knew that that man was the only way that their problem is going to be fixed. And listen, we, the body of Christ, are the vessels that God uses to impact people's lives. It is the church. It is your life and my life that we have to be interrupted in our daily schedule sometimes to do what God wants us to do. But then there are three ways or three things that keep us from doing what God wants us to do. Okay? And don't get mad at me. I'm just telling you the truth. The first one is self-centeredness. Somebody give me an amen. amen. Sometimes we think about me. Sometimes what I want is my priority. And what, sometimes what God says, it is not about you necessarily. Sometimes it's about what I want you to do. Philippians chapter 2 verse 4. Let each of you look not at your own interest, but also for the interest of others. Don't look at yourself all the time. Sometimes we can't say this. What do I get out of it? Sometimes we have to say, what can I give to them? What can I serve for them? Sometimes it's our self-centeredness. And sometimes the lack of spirituality within our souls, we get caught up in the me syndrome instead of the them syndrome. The second thing is materialism. 
materialism. In Luke chapter 16, verse 13, it says, No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. It didn't say it's hard to serve God and money. It says you cannot serve God and money. And this is where I want to give, where's Anthony at? I want to give Anthony and Becca some prompts here. They are heading up our Financial Peace University. 36 in his class. Let's give you, awesome. You know, you know the issue? The, the issue of materialism is exactly what he talks about. Sometimes we have to act our wage. Sometimes we have to spend what we have, not what we want. And sometimes we are so far in debt that we can't do what God wants us to do because we're so stuck on what I want and what I can get. And sometimes when we're talking about serving, talking about giving, talking about loving, talking about the children of God and the family of God, we are so far in debt that we can't even do what God wants us to do. Oh, what? I did not hear one amen on that one. You know, money, money sometimes causes people to get so self-centered and so caught up in what they're trying to get that they cannot love and do what God wants them to do. The family of God sometimes is just too materialistic. Sometimes we just need to take a step back and see what God really wants. And then per perfection. Sometimes we feel like our perfectionism. Sometimes we feel like I'm not good enough. Sometimes I feel like I'm not smart enough. Somebody else can do a better job or somebody else should be able to do it. But when the Holy Spirit says, this job is for you. This is what I want you to do. You don't know what I've been preparing them for, but I need to let you know I am preparing you for such a time as this to do exactly what I want you to do. So shut up about not being good enough. Because what I want you to do, I have prepared you to do it. And sometimes we just think, I can't, or I don't want to, I'm scared to. If you're a child of God, God has equipped you, and God has used your issues within your life, your experiences, your shape, your personality. He has used you, and he has prepared somebody else for you. And God has a divine moment planned. And what we can say is, I don't know what you want me to do, but Lord, I am willing to go through that door. And when we are willing to go through the door that God has prepared for us, it is wonderful. It's awesome. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, it says, But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of this world to put to shame the things that are mighty. It, to be used of God is not that you have to be the smartest, the best, the strongest. To be used of God, you just have to be available. You have to say, okay, Lord... That's what I'll do. I want to be used by you. And I want to be used through you. And then, let's go to the third point. Serving Jesus means being faithful. It means just being faithful. You know, we are a volunteer organization. No, nobody here has to be here. You came through those doors. You got up this morning. And you came here to serve because you wanted to. And because you wanted to, you came here. And that is called faithfulness. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, it says, Moreover, it's required in a steward that one be found faithful. What is our motivation? What, what is it that we have to be faithful in? We are not faithful to the church. We're faithful to God. You don't serve the church. You serve in the church. But who you're serving is you're serving God. And God has uniquely put you in a certain place to do certain things that God is honored in. And when God is glorified, when God is praised, then God can honor. In John chapter 17, verse 4, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. When John is saying, I have finished the job, the thing that you have asked me to do, I have finished. Jesus is done. He's fulfilled. And what we can do is we have to fulfill what God has called us to do. And that's to finish the work. We, we cannot change the redemption of mankind. 
but what we can do is we can bring men to the redemption of mankind. And that's the job of the church. It's the job of the church in the world. It's the job of the church in Kansas. And it's the job of the church in Wichita to always point people to Jesus Christ. That that is a servant that is faithful. Whether it is in the nursery or the preschool or the junior high or the high school or in the worship ministry, it is our job. For the love of Christ compels us because he judges us. That if one died for all, then all have died. And he died for all. And those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. For those that live him, that love him, we are not living for ourselves. We are living for Christ. And if we live for Christ, everything changes. Many of us have the grasp that the things that are important are the things that are seen. But in volunteerism, it's totally opposite of that. The most important people in this church are not the people that are on, that are on the stage. The most important people in this church are the people that serve behind doors. It's the people that serve at 9 o'clock in the morning or 6 o'clock at night or in the afternoon. It's the people that are in the nursery and nobody gives them a pat on the back. See, we, we see the things on the outside and we think that is what God blesses. And I believe something totally different than that. I believe God blesses those that are unseen. I believe God I believe those that are willing to do what nobody wants to do or nobody gets praised for, when you are sacrificing and you are serving God in those areas, God smiles on that. And God blesses that. God honors that. You know, it's something as simple as, as building a house. And you can have this beautiful house on the outside. And this contractor was building the house, but he had to build a, a, a ditch and he had to build a ditch from the house to the electric pole. And you know what? The house could look beautiful. But you know what's so important? Is that ditch has to be dig. Because if he did not dig the ditch, there would be no power to the house. The house could look great. But if the ditch is not dug, the house is worthless. And so often we look at the ministries, we look at the stage, we look at the facilities. And it is absolutely worthless. Without people digging the ditch. Without people serving. You know, I can get accolades and I can go to pastor's conferences and I can speak all day long. But my volunteers, the people that love this church, I would not get invited one place to speak one time if it wasn't for you. The volunteers, the service, the love that you give to this church. That is what God wants. Sometimes we can't see the small. And sometimes we can't see what people think are the insignificant. But the insignificant in people's minds are the most powerful in God's hands. God chose the weak things to profound the wise. And the weak things to strengthen the mighty. We think of ourselves, yeah, I'm just doing preschool. Or I'm just cleaning the bathrooms. Or I'm just mowing the grass. I'm just straightening the chairs. But those little things are what makes God's ministry work. Elvis. Elvis had 18 number one hits. 38 top 10 hits. But he never won a Grammy for any one of those hits. He did win a Grammy for a song that the Gaither brothers called, He Touched Me. And the verse went something like this. I'm not going to sing it. I'm just going to quote it. <laughs> Amen. Praise Jesus. <laughs> after the lightning and thunder. I read that. I thought maybe it was Garth Brooks. But after the lightning and thunder, after the last bell has rung, I want to bow down before Jesus and hear him say, Well done, my son. He is my reason for living. He is my king of kings. I long to be his possession. He is my everything. A man that struggled with his life. Won a Grammy for a song. 
that told him everything he needed to do. I bow on my knees and cry holy. And as a servant of God, there's not a better ending to our life and a purpose for our life than to understand one day we will stand before God and we are going to hear him say, well done, my faithful, what? Servant. Serve well. The ending is miraculous. The purpose is to change people's lives. There is absolutely nothing, zero, that you do on this earth that God doesn't see. The good, the bad, and the ugly is never hidden from the eyes of God. But those servant hearts, those little things that you do, the opportunities that you pray and you minister and you do that nobody sees, remember, God sees all. In John chapter 17, verse 4, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. Let us finish as Jesus finished well.